today's topic is building the gift pipeline through volunteers and current donors. And so for those of you that might be new uh, to and, and not know Civic Champs or myself, my name is Gung. It's like gung-ho, if that's easier to remember. Um, uh, I went to Michigan State for my undergrad, um, Harvard uh, uh, from uh, business school. And then previously, you know, I uh, to Civic Champs, I'd always been in the for-profit sector uh, with uh, consulting with McKinsey and Company and later with a couple tech startups. Um, and then, but I do love volunteering. And so I uh, spent a lot of my time with United Way, uh, an organization called the Dementia Mill and then Habitat as well. Um, and then with me today, is Adam uh, from, from GiveZ. Um, and so Adam is the uh, former co-founder and, and CEO at Gravity, uh, which some of you may know uh, is another tech company uh, here in the nonprofit space. Um, he has his education from Babson College and Merrimack College. Um, and today he's the CEO and founder of GiveZ. Um, and so, yeah, Adam, super excited to have you on. Um, thanks for kicking off the new year with us. Oh, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe for the audience, um, I was gonna, uh, you know, give, give a little bit of the background on Gibsy, but, um, you know, could you, you know, let us know sort of, um, uh, you know, what, what is Gibsy and what all do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Gibsy is the, 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 really the, the first company focused on gift documentation and, uh, and documentation of gift intent. We've, uh, we spent a lot of time sort of trying to figure out, um, how we, get gift intent documented. And uh, we found that a lot of organizations were using DocuSign, they were using uh, PDFs or Word documents, mailing them out. And uh, and we just thought that there had to be a better way. And uh, and so we, we we had started the company off as, uh, as the first give now, pay later company uh, about two years ago. So the first problem we tried to solve was, um, could we use the buy now, pay later model uh, for nonprofits and allow donors to make and split their gifts? And uh, mm. we had a really hard time with that model, with uh, particularly with regulatory the regulatory hurdles to um, to, to get uh, to be a lender, even on small amounts of micro loans, were, were just they were so expensive to to overcome. Hmm. Uh, it was it, between ten and fifteen million. We we sort of estimated that we would have to spend to change laws, and uh, it just wasn't a space that that I was I, I knew much about. And uh, and I was at a conference, and we were talking to somebody about um, about a gift invoice, and then. Uh, they wanted to be able to send an email to 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 invoice a gift that a donor said they were going to make. And uh, and one of our customers, they uh, they, they were using Give Now Pay Later for an auction, and a family bought a set of four Red uh, Red Sox tickets at the auction. And the VP emailed me and said, "Hey Adam, could you could you create a, just a little email that we could send over to invoice this Give Now Pay Later gift so that they can make the payment?" And immediately I realized um, I, I was a frontline fundraiser for a long time. I realized that. There was nothing out there that allowed frontline fundraisers to send invoices to donors once they confirmed that they were going to make a gift. And I just sort of immediately knew um, we had to transition the company. So we shut down Give Now, Pay Later, and we doubled down on uh, on uh, gift documentation and gift formalization. And the company's taken off like crazy. It's uh, it, it's just a rocket ship right now. Uh, we're closing customers at a, a really, really high rate, and they're really large customers, particularly because... Um, the process that most people have now is either a DocuSign process or a PDF yeah. process, but it doesn't do invoicing. It doesn't do uh, hmm. the, the long-term invoicing and multi-year commitments. And it doesn't allow the donor to have a really great formalized and professionalized experience when they're making a multi-year commitment. Um, and ultimately we've been able to scale sort of the process that nonprofits use for major gifts down to the mid-level and uh, it's okay. filled pipelines and uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great ride and, and we continue to innovate pretty well. Yeah, and and you've been in the space for quite a while, um, right? And 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 so you, obviously you were with Gravity before this, and and um, uh, and so tell me, yeah, what what brought you into the space? Like, why are you so passionate about it? And and maybe you know, given that you're sort of at the forefront of uh, technology in the space, like what's what's been the most exciting things that you've seen in 2023, and you know, what what makes you excited for 24? Yep. So um, so so you go all the way back. My mother was a frontline fundraiser, and uh. Uh, my sisters and I grew up pretty poor and and my mother worked at the college that I went to so that um, so we could go there for free. And that was the only way I was going to be able to go to college. And uh, mm -hmm. she, she worked there in fundraising. She was a gift processor. And so from a very early age, I was in her office opening up checks. And uh, I still have some of the paper cut scars on my, on my fingers because they were all checks. And I just opened checks day after day. Um, so I knew a lot about fundraising. And uh, I, I went to Merrimack College and uh, I became a coach after that. And I was a men's women's volleyball coach. I'd started a company. I'd sold it. I wanted to coach as a career and uh, I was working at a manual college in Boston and I was making $8,000 a year as a coach. And, uh, and the president came to my office one day 
I'd won an award for uh, for recruiting uh, like top talent. And I was like one of the top recruiters in the country. And she said, listen, I saw you won this award. Congratulations. Would you consider using those skills to help us fundraise and build relationships with donors? <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I got into fundraising and right right at the beginning of when I was learning about databases and all that stuff and, and donor data, um, we had won the Olympics in 2008 uh, in volleyball. And what we had learned when we won the Olympics um, was that uh, sort of a money ball approach, a statistical approach to volleyball was how you can win. And we found sort of the training methods that we had were wrong based on a bunch mm. of the data we had. And when we got into fundraising, I sort of realized quickly that um, we had all this data on our donors, but we weren't using much of that data to help facilitate great relationships and encourage frontline fundraisers to be in touch with the right donors at the right time. So I, uh, I left Emmanuel, took a job at Babson College so I could get my MBA, and uh, I wanted to start another business. And I met my co-founder there, and he was a quant, and uh, and he had developed the first set of sort of predictive algorithms for the stock market. And we put what he learned in predictive uh, analytics and in early AI in what I knew about fundraising together, and we invented the first AI product uh, back in 2015. And uh, and it was essentially it was uh, it started off as a dashboard, but it quickly became self writing emails. And um, we actually held the patents on early GPT, uh, which we sold uh, back in 2019 and then 2021. So it was a uh, it was great. We spent five years sort of bringing AI to the nonprofit space, and uh, we learned a lot, and, and we sort of loved it. And you know, I think right now uh, AI is sort of having a, a really great moment, obviously yeah. with GPT and all that, but. Um, we were the originators of that technology for the nonprofit space. And uh, yeah, it was great. I, I remember telling people about sort of how we trained our first models. You know, GPT is trained based on, uh, you know, the, the longitudinal data. Sure. Yeah. We used, um, Hillary Clinton's emails that were released <laughs> on the web for the very first version for how we created self-writing emails. And uh, uh, you know, there, there were like hundreds of thousands of emails and we created this algorithm that would go through and learn the writing style of Hillary Clinton and we could write like her. Um, and it was a wild journey, but it, it was awesome. And, uh, and it, it really set the stage for how nonprofits are using AI now and um, really the value props that people look at for AI. Um, we had invented those. So I, I love the nonprofit space. I, uh, we know it well and um, yeah, we're proud to be in it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, 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 you know, obviously, you know, Civic Chance, we're, we're all about volunteering and, 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 um, you know, supporting volunteer managers and, and volunteer coordinators. I've always felt that, um, you know, treating our donors and volunteers, like oftentimes we treat them pretty separately. You know, do you, you know, what is your perspective, right? Is there a, a better, more integrated approach, right? Like, um, obviously your background's on the fundraising side, but, you know, uh, volunteers are big, uh, big donors themselves, um, you know, not just in time, but also financially uh, with 79% donating. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to get, you know, what is your perspective, Adam? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, Based on the early days of, of Gravity, we spent a lot of time combining private data, big public data, and behavioral data. And I think what we found early on was that uh, most people know this, but obviously you have um, capacity scores for donors, you know, and, and you know, this donor can give a uh, million to 2.5 million. This donor can give 10 million to 20 million. This donor could give 50,000 to 100,000. And you sort of have these capacity scores. But I think when you look at the indicators for affinity, um, volunteerism is probably the number one indicator mm. of affinity. So if you have capacity but no affinity, you don't really have a donor. If the donor doesn't care but can give money, they're not going to give money. And if the donor if the donor has affinity but no capacity, um, there might be ways to engage that donor. And I think that, you know, based on the conversations you and I have had, Gung, I, I think a yeah. lot of the work that you guys are doing, trying to facilitate and cultivate relationships with donors on the volunteerism side. It, it just, it checks one of the two boxes that has to be checked. Um, and really the only box that sort of has to be checked. You can get a donor that doesn't have much money to give uh, a lot of time, a lot of support to nonprofits that that are just as valuable as money that the nonprofit might take the money for if they had it and used to mm, hire that person. Right. Volunteerism is, is absolutely probably the core of the indicators for affinity. And I just think that... Uh, uh, volunteerism, if you can continue to facilitate and cultivate a healthy volunteer community where volunteerism is not just uh, not just uh, time, but it's actual involvement and care, yeah. I think the work people do to to facilitate, cultivate, and, and really develop volunteers is, uh, is probably at the core of what most major gifts are built on as they go through, as the donors go through their careers. Got it. You know, nah, I, I, yeah, I, I obviously agree. I, I should bring you on my sales calls. 
<laughs> Adam, <laughs> have you convinced the EDs and, and boards of, of the value of volunteers? I think oftentimes it's you know seen as a cost center, right? So yeah, so so Gung, what's your experience with uh with major donors and, and volunteers? And do you find that a lot of major donors and mid-level donors volunteer? Yeah, no, I mean, I you know, we we see, you know, generically, right, you have uh, you know, over 80% of donors volunteer and and 79% of volunteers uh donate, right? So there's a huge overlap. Um and I would say, you know, mid-level and, and even major donors, whether that's um, you know, board capacity, whether that's skill volunteering, but you know, oftentimes we've heard uh these great stories, right? Like um, you know, I'm 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 here in Indianapolis and there's a big food bank called Gleaners, right? And and they just had a uh, a million dollar uh, gift, a planned gift um come through this past year from a um a former high school teacher, right? And and she had volunteered with them for you know 20 years, right? Coming every every weekend to to work with them. And no one knew, right? And then when no one guessed, right? Her I'm sure her her uh, uh, wealth engine score was not super high necessarily, right? Um, but to your point, her affinity was super, super high. And because she loved, uh, you know, the, the mission and she really believed in it, you know, I think her first gift, you know, they did, she did sort of a test gift, right, of $5,000 or, or $10,000. And that's, you know, when she got on the radar, you know, for the major gift officers, et cetera. But, um, you know, those are the kind of the stories that, I, you know, I feel are, uh, that I've heard, right, as as we started working with organizations, um, here, you know, across the country about volunteers who turn out to be mid level or or major donors, or you know, in, in many ways they they are also uh, testing, right? Like most people donate first, then volunteer. Um, I would say I think it's like I saw uh, something like a little over fifty, right? But there is a you know slightly less than half will volunteer first and then donate, right? Yeah. Um, and some of that is also their testing, and in much the same way to see you know is this an organization that I want to support, right? And volunteering is a way for for folks to really understand that mission, see for themselves, right? The the impact that the organizations are having, and so I think that's um, uh, super powerful. Yeah, yeah. So I would imagine. I mean, the way we look at the market, obviously. Uh, there's a whole bunch of types of organizations, but we see it as, you know, there's three real sub verticals in the nonprofit space. There's higher ed, there's nonprofits, and then there's healthcare. And the nonprofits, I mean, higher ed, you, you probably don't have to test much, right? Because you, you went to the college, you're giving back. Right. It makes sense. But in the nonprofit space, I can totally imagine that uh, if you're a donor with capacity, even mid-level capacity, um, the nonprofit success or failure with that donor is probably primarily based on uh, whether their work is impactful and how engaged they can get the donor early on. Um, yeah. And I imagine volunteerism is is probably at the core of of what matters there. Um, how do they engage? How, how can they get the donor involved? Right, right, yeah. And I think I mean, if you if you just do the simple math, right? Of if uh, if it's you know if you're an average uh, nonprofit and 79% of volunteers donate, if you increase your volunteer numbers by 100, right, um, in, a, in a year, that's 79 new donors, right? I would, Absolutely. I would, <laughs> you know, I would contend most, uh, uh, you know, uh, fundraisers out there, right? If you could say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna increase the number of new donors to this organization by 79. Man, you know, most EDs would be <laughs> pretty <laughs> ecstatic, yeah, totally. right? And in, in terms of uh, uh, that outcome, so totally. Um, well, awesome. And then, so one of the other things I've, I've, uh, I, I think, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. So, you know, Gizzy does invoicing and also manages pledges. Is that right, Adam? Oh yeah. 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 So, so, uh, a whole bunch of use cases we sort of found for this early on, um, we wanted to be sort of the, the DocuSign for nonprofits and we wanted to be the QuickBooks for nonprofits when it came to invoicing. And, uh, and I know as a frontline fundraiser, one of the biggest challenges I had, I was responsible when I was at Babson, I was responsible for the entire West coast. So I was a major gifts officer and I would go out to California and I'd have five or six meetings at uh, the same Starbucks. I'm sure any fundraiser on here knows exactly what I'm talking about. You go to that Starbucks, you sit down and you get your coffee and you just sort of keep the coffees coming and donor comes in, they leave, you take your notes. Next donor comes in, leave, you take your notes. And, uh, and what always struck me was, you know, I, I, I do this whole song and dance with all these donors and I was pretty good at inspiring them to make gifts because I, I really believe I was an entrepreneur. I was at the place I wanted to be. I, I loved it. But when they said, listen, I, Adam, I, I'm happy to renew my $10,000 gift. My, my next statement would be great. You know, when I get back to the office uh, next week, I'll send you an email with the link. All you have to do is click on it and make your gift. That's crazy. Uh, and all I kept thinking was, 
man, I should just be sending them that uh, almost an invoice right now so they can make their gift whenever they're ready to make it. But it should, it's the direction should be changed because what happens with every frontline fundraiser is that you get all these verbal commitments. And then at the end of the fiscal year and the end of the calendar, you have all these live bonds, side bonds that uh, said they were going to make gifts. And your boss is saying, Hey, I thought you said that she said she was going to make a $10,000 gift. And you have to email, you know, the donor and say, Hey, just wanted to follow up, make sure you receive this email. And it's like, you just keep pestering these people and pestering them and pestering them. But in the for-profit space, we get bills every single month and the bill companies pester us and gifts aren't bills, but when they're making a payment, the transaction, it can be treated almost like a, a bill it could, because you, you, the, the act of transferring money isn't the act of philanthropy. They're, they're very different. A gift intent is not the, the same as transferring cash or stock or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so I think what we were able to do is disconnect um, a donor's intent to make a gift and their actual physical ability to do that. And if we can support them in making it so easy to make their gift with reminders and invoices, it, it just makes it way more formal. And what's ultimately happened is that frontline fundraisers are now not bill collectors. They're actually finally fundraisers again. But I probably spent half my time following up with donors that said they were going to make gifts and trying to get them to actually make the transaction. But that was a waste. I mean, I, I should have been out soliciting and cultivating more gifts and more donors. Mm, interesting. And then again, you know, flipping that, right? Like, how, how do you, um, how do you see that applying on the volunteering side, right? Like, is there, is there a possibility to do, you know, something similar, right, in terms of volunteer pledges, which, you know, even, even with all the hundreds of nonprofits we work with, I don't think I've necessarily seen much of that, but I think it's a really interesting concept. But, you know, um, is that something that you think could apply? Or like, how, how would you go about it? So I, 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 you and I had spent a decent amount of time talking about this. And I think um, the concept of a, a pledge right now is only financial. Um, I'm going to give a $20,000 gift over the next four years. It'll be $5,000 a year. There's no reason why pledges can't be applied to volunteerism. Over the next five years, I'm going to give 20 hours a year. I mean, it, that's th th there's something there that can be documented. And I think that's a super interesting uh, augmentation on a pledge. Um, yeah. I, I commit to donating a certain amount of time per year or per month, along with my financial commitment. Um, and there are a lot of donors who would rather make a bit of a smaller financial gift because, for whatever reason, and also commit to making uh, a gift of time. And that gift of time, if used correctly, is either as impactful or more impactful than a financial gift. And I think that right. whatever that is, the ability to document a, a pledge of time we've never seen that before. And I think that's mm. a super interesting concept because yeah. what you essentially would do there is you would make that a KPI. And I think uh, I, I talked to a VP a couple of weeks ago who said, you know, if I could say that there's 25,000 hours of pledge time available, the question doesn't become, do people care? The question is, what could I do with that 25,000 hours of additional power of, of people power? And I think that's super, super mm. interesting. Uh, it also gives the frontline fundraisers the ability to ask for something that a donor can give. Um, one of the best pieces hmm. of advice uh, on negotiating that I ever got was, um, you should never ask in a negotiation for something that somebody cannot give you. Um, I, it, I was coaching and one of my bosses, she, she was applying for a job at a school in the Midwest and uh, and she wanted, she wanted like a half million dollar salary or whatever it was. And the organization was much smaller than that. And she said, you know, if I had asked for that, they would have just said no, even though that I was the right fit. If 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 somebody can't give you something, it doesn't make sense to 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 use it in that way. Mm. I think giving frontline fundraisers the ability to ask for something that a donor can give, um, that's where this gets really interesting. Uh, Gung, would you consider pledging twenty hours over the next year for the next five years? You know, would you consider giving the organization sure. hundred hours yeah. to do something that's useful for the organization? Um, there's a lot of value there that I think really could make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 when I say, you know, we haven't, you know, we haven't seen the formalized, right? Obviously, with mentors and some of these programs where uh, you ask people to have a minimum commitment to be a volunteer, right? Like, I, I you know, we've seen that. But I, to your point, right? It's uh, it's rarely documented, and certainly not in sort of this sort of over time sort of pledge uh, yeah. uh, profile. So. Um, and, and I guess, you know, one of the other things that that's really interesting for, for me, right. Is this, um, you know, if, if you are able to capture, you know, uh, you know, we have 25,000 or even 2000 or 200 hours pledged, uh, for this upcoming year, you know, how would we want to allocate or spend it? Um, you, you know, I, I guess, 
to the same question you had earlier around, hey, you know, we aren't able to collect on our financial pledges sometimes, you might not be able to collect on your volunteer pledge. And so how, you know, would you think about that or treat that any differently, Adam? No, I, I think, you know, so um, I think one of the things that we've learned over the past six months is that uh, at, on the major, major gift side, if you're, if you're talking about a $20 million gift, um, odds are that most organizations aren't using that $20 million in cash. They're using it to borrow against that money. So um, you know, if somebody makes a twenty thousand dollar or twenty million dollar commitment, the organization goes out, takes a loan, a bond out against that twenty million, and that's how they use that. And so the bond is collateralized by these large gifts. That's why large gifts have so many legal aspects of them, because they they essentially they're being used for collateral. On the mid level, you know, if somebody makes a twenty thousand dollar commitment over five years, um, Harvard, if it was to Harvard, Harvard would not sue that donor if they didn't fulfill that commitment. Right. And so the, the question is, um, you know, if a donor lapses or, 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 or doesn't fulfill their hourly commitment, um, no, there's probably nothing you can do about it. But there is something to be said about uh, having somebody agree to something in writing is much different yeah. than having somebody agree to something verbally. It's just, right. it, it's, it's very obvious sure. and it's pretty clear. And we see it in every part of our life. If you write it down, it's more likely to happen. And there's no reason why, if you can make it easy enough for a donor to make uh, a written commitment, there's no reason why that commitment wouldn't be fulfilled unless something changed for the donor. Right. And we see fulfillment rates at 96, 97% when there are gift agreements uh, in place at any level. So why wouldn't the same apply for volunteerism? If you said you're going to, in writing, volunteer 20 hours next year, right. why wouldn't you? It doesn't really make any sense. So Right, right. No, I, th I think the art and the act of documentation actually increases fulfillment rates. And that can be applied to time, it can be applied to, to money be applied to anything maybe, maybe that'll be our new new product of, of the year and and pivot for, for civic champs uh, much like you all did that. so um well no this is this is great um and the and and i i would say you know for folks that are listening in right or, or or you know if you have questions you know please do put them in the chat uh, we are monitoring and looking at those so you know if you if there's things that um that you hear adam uh you know talk about that you're like oh i actually have a follow up on that um uh, please do share and you know we'll try to circle back to that as well right um i think one of the things you know from a learning goals that we we talked about for today um that i wanted to just uh, uh dive into a little bit more is you know, how, how can volunteers fill that mid-level or multi-year giving gap? And so we've already talked about, you know, how could you do pledges with, with volunteers? Um, you know, one idea could be that, uh, you know, if, if they're not able to, uh, maybe their, their life changes and they're getting busy, maybe you change it into a financial ask, right? And say, hey, you know, obviously, um, if we don't have your volunteer time, right, we need to pay staff to do this and could you give some dollars? Um, but, you know, what other ideas or, you know, how else could you... Uh, you know, uh, engage your volunteers, right, to sort of fill that mid-level or multi-year giving gap? Yeah, so um, first of all, the the laws of scale absolutely apply to this, right, where if you can find a way to have an engaged donor volunteer, um, you can ask them to bring more volunteers. You can ask them to introduce mm -hmm. you to the folks. Uh, we see that network effect work more and more often um, when the donor is engaged and the closer the donor is to the organization, the more willing they are to advocate for the organization. It's almost like a, um, like an MPS, you know, if, if you're, if you're happy with the organization, if you feel positive about it, you will volunteer time. And if you're willing to volunteer time, you're probably willing to introduce the organization to friends and family and other supporters. And if you're willing to do that, you, that advocacy makes a big difference. So, that, that's one immediate effect. Um, but I think the second is uh, every donor should be triple asked or quadruple asked, right? I mean, they should be asked for money. They should be asked for time. They should be asked for, um, they could be asked for a state gifts or a major gift if there's capacity. Um, making appropriate empathetic asks and inspiring donors to give in any way that they can is sort of the name of the game at any level of giving, right? I, I mean, empathy mm -hmm. is at the core of everything that we do. Our ability to truly understand our donors' intentions um, their situation is how great frontline fundraisers do their jobs. And I think that as we work through sort of the mid-level where at scale, you can't have a one-to-one -one relationship, sure. making sure donors feel like the experience is personalized, making sure the donor feels um, that the, the, the things that they're being asked for are appropriate and that their situation is being taken in and under consideration and into consideration, um, filling that mid-level pipeline 
that's at the core of it. I mean, empathy is at the core of all we do. Um, so I think finding ways to personalize at scale, um, mm. one to one to many, you know, I, and we did it, I think we did it really well at Gravity. I think, you know, when we were developing yeah. self-writing emails, it was the first AI, right? So the emails were sent to the frontline fundraiser and it would say, hey, Gung, you might want to consider reaching out to this donor. They have capacity. Here was the last time you reached out to them. And here's an email that you might want to yeah. send based on all the last contacts. Um, that one-to-one -one relationship at scale being able to empower frontline fundraisers to build more relationships. Yeah. That's what I think, you know, volunteerism in particular, um, asking for the right things, it can make a huge difference. Um, and you just never know where donors' careers are going to go. You never know where their financial sure. sort of, but you don't, you can't predict the future. Yeah. So you want to put yourself in a great position with as many donors as possible. Um, and I think that works and happens when you're asking for the right things at the right times. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, and and we've certainly felt that this past year, right? So we've, you know, started building more and more integrations with the donor CRM platforms like Razor's Edge, Little Green Light for the smaller nonprofits, right? And, um, you know, Salsa, and we're looking at, you know, folks like uh, Donor Perfect. Um, and one of the things that we've heard quite quite a bit, right, is, you know, if you have the data, right, to, to actually see Hey, you know, um, Adam volunteered twice last 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 week, right? So you're sitting down for that coffee chat to acknowledge that, personalize that experience. But if it's mid level, right? If you're not doing the one on one, you could still uh, use AI or otherwise, right? To um, to you know um, leverage that data to say, hey, you know, maybe maybe actually pull, give me a list, right, of everyone that volunteered 20 hours uh, but hasn't given this year, right? The, to your point, that affinity is is quite high. Um, and then one of the things, you know, we'll show perhaps here in a little bit, right, is uh, for Civic Champs, as an example, we also collect feedback around, uh, you know, whether someone had actually had a good time or not, right? Did they enjoy their experience? And so you could actually, you know, further narrow that list so that it's, you're excluding the folks that said, no, I, didn't, I actually didn't have a great time, right? And, and you know, treat them, so, you know, you still want to reach out, but uh, maybe not for a, uh, for, for an ask necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, how about uh, how about general innovation in the space? I mean, what what are you seeing in, in terms of what frontline fundraisers can use and what uh, volunteer managers can use? I mean, what's what's at the top of your list for innovation right now? I mean, I think I think like uh, tools like ChatGPT are, are extremely helpful, right? I think they're surprisingly easier than most people give credit, uh, you know, think about, right? And and they're free, and so that's probably the first thing I'd I'd advise. Um, folks to take a look at, right? Is if you haven't used ChatGPT, you just go on and make an account and you can you can make it, you can, I think the biggest benefit for me, even I use it pretty much every day, is it removes the blank page problem, right? It's not gonna create the most beautiful thing, you know, necessarily all the time, but you're like, hey, like I need to write a grant. I need to write a uh, uh, an email. I need to write whatever it is, right? You could just put it in there. It'll spit out something that's probably pretty reasonable, Right. And then and then you can make the edits. Right. And editing for me is always so much faster and easier than it is to to come, you know, to, to when you see that blank page. Right. It's, it's just daunting. Um, so, so, so for so, me, so, yeah. So are you saying first draft? Yeah. First draft. Great first draft. First draft. Yeah. Yeah. First great. Great first draft. You know, and, and well, and I think, you know, uh, AI can. um the really good ones will, will will be you know maybe you know purpose built right like the, um can can be really great um I think the uh you know if you really want to make it um sort of show your voice right um, that takes a little bit more training right usually it's not like you know Hillary Clinton had a lot of emails to learn off of um and it may over time right if you connect it with your email system maybe it could but even you know forgetting all that right that's a lot of work to you could yeah. just you know get it, get that first draft without a lot of personalization and, and, and learning, right? Um, I think, you know, on the volunteering side, you know, obviously we're excited with, uh, with Civic Champs, right, as, you know, this ability to bring technology to space, right, using mobile, using geofencing. I think the most exciting thing for me has been actually providing mobile technology, not necessarily for the volunteers, right, but really for the volunteer coordinator and managers, because what we found is, a lot of times they're not in front of your computer, right? You're like running around. A lot of volunteer managers wear multiple hats, right? And so they're they're out in the warehouse, they're out somewhere else, but they still need to manage their their work. And so if you have a solution where you could see the roster of your volunteers, right? If you can, um, you know, tap into their name and see their phone number and email. And so that's an area we really want to lean into a bit more: is how do you empower people that are on the go 
with sort of that same level of technology and tools that they expect when they're at the office, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, one of uh, uh, before I started Gravity, one of the ideas that I was working on was a, a, a small convenience store. It's called they were called Greenleaf Convenience, and uh, I didn't know anything about convenience stores, nor did I know anything about real estate, and, and that's what sort of made the company die. But uh, but one of the concepts and one of the beliefs that that we had as a founding team uh, was that sort of what Amazon's doing now with was sort of like the the the, uh, the cashier list checkouts, the, mm. the the people list checkouts. Um, the geofencing, the uh, the eye beacons, like all yeah. of those things. How do you use um, hardware supported by software to enable uh, volunteer coordinators? And there's actually a question here, but from Melanie, um, how might these concepts apply for group volunteering, where the organization is communicating with a designated person rather than each individual? Um, and so that volunteer coordinator. Um, mobile technology that is approachable, accessible, data rich and action rich. I think the action piece, making sure the volunteer yeah. um, coordinators have data that leads to action in the right ways. Right. It feels like, I mean, and I know you guys at Civic Champs are doing such great work with, with that. What, what would you say to, to specific ways volunteer managers can, can use technology? Well, you know, one of the things, um, and, and maybe, uh, you know, addressing uh, Melanie's question here a little bit too, is, um, that we're super excited about for this year is we're rolling out chat as an example, right? And so again, I think, you know, if you think about, you ha you have to bring value. You have to bring value to the volunteer. You have to bring value to the volunteer coordinator. And so if you, if you say, hey, you know, volunteer, can you download this app to do X, Y, Z thing? You know, there's a good number that'll just do it because you asked them to, right? Because they're like, okay, fine. Um, but there's others that are like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to install another thing, right? But if you give them a reason to, right, like, hey, we're going to have all our communications, right? If you go to a conference, actually, like, usually I don't download apps, right? But if I go to a conference as a conference app, I've actually found it to be super helpful. And that every time I have that experience, I'm now like, oh, if there's a conference, I'm going to download the conference app because I can so, do chat. I can see my so, my, my agenda, um, et cetera, right? I, I feel the exact opposite. I hate downloading apps. I have an app, I have an app for case one. I have an app for case two. I have an app for case three. <laughs> I have an app for case four, case five. K6, AGB, K6, like I have an app for every one of those. So I, maybe this isn't the right form to get into it, but uh, mobile first versus app first. Uh, I wish oh, there was a tool because, uh, man, I would go mobile first every time. Well, uh, I think, but but you still downloaded it, right? Um, I think oh, no, it's... no, 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 you don't have to. I mean, you, you go to, you just go to the, you use the web, right? I mean, the web is the Oh, best. sure. No, 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 yeah, yeah. There yeah. is. That's, that's and, fair. And, and with, with mobile technology, like it's all... Um, everything doesn't need to be app based. Uh, right. you, you can get notifications on on mobile and all that. It's just oh, it's so it, it's so interesting. But I no, I hate I hate too many apps. But a singular <laughs> app for a purpose. Yes, uh, and, and that well, well and, and that is that is part of our goal, right? Is to be that singular app, right? Hopefully, right to uh, around volunteers. Though. But I I do think that right, like but there is that value, right? Whether that you no, know, to your point, right? It, and, and maybe maybe mobile uh, uh, mobile you know first experience could be an even better experience. Um, but regardless, right? Like having that on the go when I'm at a conference, it's yeah. a lot easier and better than you know for for me at least, right? Like it's nice to have the paper, right? But I I toss that almost you know, or I lose it, right? Whereas like, hey, you know, I can I can um, find you, Adam, right? I might have your LinkedIn profile. I can click in on that. I can see it. I can download maybe the uh, the worksheets, right, that they have in something. And I just, you know, there's, I think, I guess my point was more that if you provide people a reason, right, and a value, and, and chat being one of those core things yeah, that yeah. it's very hard to replace otherwise. But if you can imagine you have, um, you know, um, uh, you know, we serve a lot of habitats as an example, right? And you have this, you know, 200 volunteers coming in for like a build blitz for a day. It would be awesome, I think, right? If you could have a chat with all 200 of them in there, right? Or maybe with your group, you know, of, of leaders in there and you could quickly put in, hey, you know, everyone, like there's a, there's a rain delay, right? Like, you know, you could do that through texting and emails, which we already do today, but uh, but allowing people to ask questions and say, hey, you know, where's the bathroom? And, you know, other people could jump in and say like, oh, you know, here, uh, here, you know, here's where you go. Or like, hey, you know, I, I need to find XYZ thing, right? And they say, oh, yeah, you just go to, you know, whatever the tool shed or whatever on the right. Um, and that's where that's at, right? And also, I think we'll free up the volunteer managers where all those questions before, 
we're funneling just to one person, yeah. right? And you're just like, oh my God, I have 200 people asking me things. And now they can actually help each other, right? Which most people are pretty good about. So anyway, I think those are some of the things that I, I get pretty excited about. It's like, because volunteering is about community. And so to the degree that we can help, you know, reinforce or build that community from a technology standpoint um, is, is pretty exciting. Yeah, so, so so I think apps are wonderful for uh, information dissemination, right? So uh, for the habitats, I would imagine um, you have plans, you have, there are things that you want to get done in that blitz. Um, is there a way to coordinate everybody a little bit easier by disseminating information? Um, the, the second use case for apps is always data enrichment, right? Can the, um, Melanie, to your question, can the, uh, the coordinator of all the volunteers, can they get more data on the volunteers or on the situation and get it back into the app super quickly? It's sort of like the... Um, you know, we all started off with typing and now a lot of people use like the, 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 like Siri or like a, a, a natural language processor and all of that just to get data in is better. But then the third use case is, is, is so much bigger, right? The, 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 the geo tracking, the geo fencing, all mm -hmm. of that stuff. What can technology actually enable that uh, is better than what people have now? I, I always think my, one of my, uh, one of my sons, he skis after school. And the, the bus comes back between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. And I would give anything for an app that, that just sends a text message, a quick alert that said, hey, he's five minutes away. Uh, it's time to go down. Because I get there at 5.30 and I wait until 5.57. And it's like, I live two minutes away, but I have to wait because I don't want to miss him. And I don't want him to have to wait because it's cold out and whatever. But if there could be a way for geofencing to work that way with, with a singular sure. app, volunteers, um, connecting people in ways that they're not able to be connected is one of the use cases of technology that's the absolute best. And uh, with the tech, with the, the hardware technology we have, um, I think I think in general, uh, every organization is wildly underutilizing the hardware technology we have in, in our phones and in laptops and everything else. There's better ways for software to to take advantage of the hardware that we have. And I think that's a uh, that's sort of what you guys have yeah. absolutely nailed. Yeah. And it gets better and better every year, right? Like there's, you know, the iPhone 15, 16, right? Every year it gets, it's a little stronger and, and more powerful. Also, um, who, yeah. who would have thought Apple would uh, keep with iPhone 15, 16, and 17? Right? <laughs> like Roman numerals or like, uh, like, 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 like something like colors or something. There's They took inspiration from the Super Bowl, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, ho hopefully, Melanie, that that answered your question. You know, if, if if you know, I'm not sure if you know, maybe you were thinking about pledges or uh, or donations. You know, and you're saying, hey, I, how do I communicate with? You know, another way that I've seen organizations handle. You know, if you had this corporate group comes in and you only have that one contact, right? And but you say, hey, you know, I I, I would like actually access to, to to everyone that shows up. Um, you know, we have uh, like a kiosk is a, is a kind of a, another sort of simple way, right? So apps can be good. A kiosk where, you know, people show up and they and they put in their, you know, as they check in. Um, again, having a reason why is important, right? And so waivers are one of those easy ways to, to, to have people be like, oh yeah, okay, I need to check in because I need to sign the waiver. Right. And so that's not only do you get the waiver done, but if there's a reason why they, they're going to approach, you know, why they're going to download the app or why they're going to approach that kiosk to make sure that they get the work done. Right. Yeah. Melanie, one of the, uh, one of the things we're building uh, later on this, this year is a, uh, is a self-serve uh, pledge form. So uh, what we keep getting asked for are affinity groups at large higher eds and large, uh, really large higher eds, but you have like a reunion year and there's three leaders for the reunion and they have a hundred people they have to get volunteer hours from and they, they have to get donations from. And what they want is the ability for a donor to be able to self-serve a pledge. So to be able to fill out their own pledge form and to have the funds uh, specifically specified by the volunteer managers. So hmm. instead of having a thousand funds that the donor could give to, there are three funds that the class as a group is supporting. So that concept of self-serve that uh, enables uh, a singular donor to, on behalf of the group, make a multi-year commitment with a pledge uh, without having to uh, talk to a frontline fundraiser. Uh, it's a super interesting use case that I, I never thought of before one of our customers asked for it. But uh, I, I think those type of technologies where one to many in a self-serve uh, form is probably going to be the future of uh, of a lot of uh, hmm. how we're dealing with that. No, that, that is super interesting. Are you, are you going to build it for them, Adam? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. We, yeah, we're, we're, we start, uh, I think in, in April is uh, that, but that whole self-serve concept, because right now you go to a giving page 
Uh, you can make your gift through credit card, Venmo, but you can't actually make just a pledge on there, uh, a multi-year commitment pledge. It, it, you, you can't actually create uh, an LOI on any giving page. And I think that the ability to create LOIs and self-serve uh, pledges, that'll be uh, really allowing donors to document their intent um, hmm. through a self-serve form so that you can get to more of the mid-level and the lower mid-level giving. Um, you know, somebody wants to make a, somebody's given $250 for the last 20 years. There's no reason why a frontline fundraiser can't say, hey, listen, um, do you intend to continue to give $250 for the next five years? And the donor will probably say yes, because they've, they've done it for the past 20. Right. The frontline fundraiser should say, great, would it be okay if I just sent you over this document that documents your intent to continue to make that gift? And the doc the documentation of that intent is bookable revenue. And, uh, and, I and it also increases the fulfillment rate. So I think uh, self-serve is def definitely... Uh, an important piece of managing a group uh, with one or two folks. That yeah, no, that's um, uh, and and actually one one of the things I'd love to ask you, Adam, right, is you know obviously there's a full range of nonprofits out there, some really large, some some really small, um, and and even for us, right, like we're um, you know if you have five volunteers, like you know, we may not be the best solution, right? Like, you know, there's a whole setup, you know, et cetera for, um, but for those folks, they might still want some sort of solution, right? So, you know, be separate from Gibbsy, you know, if, if someone wanted to get started with documenting volunteer or donor intent, you know, how, how, how would they get started? Let, you know, maybe you could walk them through the progression of, hey, here's, here's a free, you know, a little bit more manual and then kind of painful version. Here's the next thing. And then here's, you know, what Gibbsy does, um, in the same way that, you know, we, what we see is like, you know, you start with like sign up genius and Google forms and, yeah. and then you move to, right. Like, uh, you know, something a little better and then you come to civic champs. Right. Um, what would you say for, you know, that capturing that intent? Yeah. So, um, so, so I think the, the first thing we can do is we can put a template out there. If, uh, you know what I'll do, I'll, I'll, if anybody wants a template for this, we can, uh, I'll put this in the chat. Just email uh, hello at gives you.com. And what we can do is we can uh, we can send you a template and essentially mm. you can use it for uh, documenting gift intent or documenting the volunteer intent. So we can send you a template for a Word document or PDF, and that could be the, the best first start for you. Um, but that template would essentially be a, a four or five year or two year pledge for time, not mm. money. Uh, we, we can get that template up today. But essentially, um, any mechanism that allows a donor to confirm uh, gift intent or volunteer time intent, um, that's what you want to get to. So I think a manual process uh, like that leading to a, a more automated process is probably the best way to do it. But if anybody emails uh, hello at givesy.com and, and asks for the uh, the volunteer template, uh, we can send it over to you. Okay. No, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have a number of free, you know, a few freebies that we were going to share uh, towards the end of the ship, you know, but, but Adam's giving, uh, out uh, another one, which is, which is great. So, um, well, also again, I, you know, I want to encourage it for anyone that's, you know, listening in here. Um, if you have questions right around, um, anything that we're, we're discussing, you know, please put that in chat. Um, I guess, you know, the last thing I wanted to ask before we, you know, uh, head back over to the, the slideshow here real quickly is, you know, are there any, um, success stories that you've seen already, um, like, you know, if, as a point of inspiration for folks, right? What, what have you seen work, um, you know, the impact that maybe a gift has had uh, to, to an organization, you know, following sort of some of the advice that you've laid out? Yeah, so we, uh, I, I think that the three things that we see uh, consistently, we have seen consistently over the last six months, uh, first, uh, smaller donors are making more multi-year commitments. So, in the past, most organizations had a threshold of fifty or hundred thousand dollars to get a pledge. Um, you, most organizations wouldn't formalize a ten thousand dollar pledge, you know, a uh, two thousand dollar a year for five year pledge. Um, formalizing that gift intent with the pledge uh, documentation, we're seeing that the pledges go down to the mid level and the lower mid level, which means that fulfillment rates are going up in those areas. So, um, multi year commitments are, are essentially improving retention automatically. Uh, because you don't have any retention problems if a donor is committing to a multi-year commitment and fulfillments are high. Um, the, the, the second is is absolutely, um, we see over and over and over that organizations are moving a lot of their DocuSign pledges 
into Givzy um, because of the follow-ups, because of the invoicing, because of all the things that happen outside of just signing the, the, the documentation. And so what's actually happening here is um, that, that DocuSign was really developed for sort of a transactional uh, confirmation of an agreement of, of, of a singular nature. What a pledge agreement is, is a multi-year commitment. So you need the invoicing on the back end. So I think a lot of organizations are moving gift agreements out of DocuSign and into uh, Givzy. And then the third is, is the transition from frontline fundraisers time uh, from being bill collectors to allowing frontline fundraisers to reallocate time that they were spending collecting on pledges to inspiring and cultivating different donors. So, um, you know, you look at like a, a William Merritt use case there, there, mm -hmm. I think there's over a million dollars under gift agreements uh, with them that they have, that, that they're just starting to send out. Uh, people are using Givzy now for LOIs for single year LOIs. So right now, if, uh, if, if we, if you make a solicitation to a donor that usually makes their gift at the end of the fiscal year in June, um, organizations uh, they're probably between five and 600 a day of these are going out with their LOIs. And it's essentially, Gung, if you were to say, uh, yes, I'm going to make my $5,000 gift this year, but I usually make it in June. So I'll, uh, I'll make it in June. I would say, hey, Gung, would you consider, would it be okay if I sent over a gift agreement just to confirm that so I don't have to bother you? And, uh, and you'll get an invoice 30 days before that, uh, before the day you say you want to do it, instead of me following up with you and saying, hey, are you still going to make that gift? Your hmm. frontline fundraisers are allowed to confirm that gift now. So I think LOIs are great. And we just have a really interesting use case where one of the organizations um, had to change a gift agreement for about 20 donors because something at the organization changed. And I think that the um, the ease of changing a gift agreement uh, through Givesy, uh is unlike anything else. And it really takes a lot of the pressure and anxiety off of organizations that need to change some of the nuts and bolts of uh, gift agreements that they'd agreed to. Uh, but it can be an uncomfortable situation with donors. So making it as easy as possible is great. Got it. Got it. No, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, um, you know, for folks, if, if you have questions, again, put it in chat um, and we can circle back to it. But before we run out of time, I wanted to just circle back to our um, presentation here real quickly to share some freebies, but also just give folks uh, a quick overview of, you know, perhaps um, if you're new to Civic Champs, um, what, uh, who we are and what we do. And so, um, so Civic Champs, right? So like I said, you know, we're a volunteer management software company. And, uh, you know, we try to be there for every stage of that volunteer life cycle for, uh, for volunteer managers. And so a couple of things that we do, the first thing is, you know, we allow for folks to do seamless check-ins. Um, what you're seeing here is on our mobile app, right? So you have this big check-in button. Uh, we also have a kiosk, you know, uh, volunteer managers can also check people in um, on their own phones as, as an example too, but super simple. We use things like geofencing and geotechnology, like Adam says, uh, to make that process easier. We know what, you know, if you are here at this time, you're probably here to volunteer for your organization, right? Um, and then if someone said, hey, you know, I had a really great experience, we also allow folks to um, uh, to make a small small dollar solicitation, right, for a donation. Um, and so for here, you could see, you know, there's a way to capture feedback. You could say whether you're happy or not. Um, and then you can make a small dollar ask after that, right? Um, and of course, we collect all of that information here on the back end, right? So you could see, you know, every entry here, including, you know, that feedback information as well. Um, one of the things that I think is really powerful, right, and, and why these integrations are, are great is you can also filter, right, and say, hey, show me everyone that had a great experience. Um, and maybe, you know, right, if, if you have this uh, volunteer pledge or, uh, right, or, or donor pledge, uh, this could be an opportunity to send, some, you know, to, to send that to that group of folks, right? To say, hey, you know, you had a fantastic time with us. Um, you know, we'd love to have you back. Would you be willing to commit to, you know, volunteering, you know, twenty hours, um, a, a, you know, a, you know, a, a quarter, right, for the next four quarters with us, or you know, twenty, you know, x number of hours, right, for the next couple of years, right? Um, and so that's, uh, that I think could be a great sort of way to engage your, your volunteers. Right? Um, yeah. And, and you could see here, right. We have these filters, right. You could sh show, you know, this is by role. You can have a filter by, um, by hours, right. So there's all, all sorts of ways to cut the data. 
Um, and then, you know, we're going to send out the slides. People always ask that. So we're going to send out the recording along with the slides here. Uh, but here is our contact information for Adam and myself. So feel free to to reach out to either of us. Um, we uh, I think Adam and I both have a passion for the space. So always excited to chat with folks um, regardless. And then um, if you, yeah, you want to get a uh, check out Gibbsy, um, here is the their website, um, gibbsy.com. You can kind of see a screenshot of uh, what this looks like on mobile and on desktop, right? Um, and it's, you know, as as noted by the uh, the slogan, right? The only end-to-end -end gift documentation platform that's out there today. Um, and then as a, as a nice little freebie or, or gift, uh, for, for folks that are joining this webinar, we are offering a discount for Civic Champs um, as well. So uh, two months free is the offer uh, and sort of good through uh, February 1st. And then last but not least, uh, we do have some exciting webinars that are coming up. So next week, uh, we're going to be talking about mentoring. Um, and we have a, a, a guest from the Mentoring Partnership, right? And so how do you onboard your mentors for lifelong engagement? Um, on the 18th, we're going to partner with our friends at Memory Fox to talk about volunteer stories, uh, crafting videos uh, that can really perform well on social media. Uh, they're really the experts in that space. And then on the 25th, uh, we have our friends from Volunteer Match um, actually taking a look at 2023 in review. They're going to share some of their proprietary data around trends that they've seen. Uh, we're going to share some of our uh, just you know fresh off the press stats as well. Um, and then our first webinar for February is going to be around impact metrics, right? And so oftentimes, um, you know, donors and volunteers, the things that they care about is, you know, is the work that I'm doing, is the money that I'm giving having an impact with the communities that I really care about? And sure, impact is going to talk, uh, help us understand that a little better there. And so with that, let me, let me stop sharing again. Um, and... Yeah, um, and I see, yeah, Chloe's put in some of the uh, uh, the links here as well in chat. So if folks wanna click in on those, we you know feel free to register for the upcoming webinars or to get the discounts. But with that, Adam, any any last minute thoughts for, for our audience? No, 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 uh, Gung, thanks for having me. It, it was, I enjoyed the conversation. Uh, yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a it's a pleasure. Uh, we haven't done as many of these sort of fireside chats uh, or conversation, but this is super fun for me. Uh, so um, I, thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom and expertise with everyone. Oh, that's good being here. Thanks so much, Gun. All right, take care, everyone. Happy New Year. Bye, folks.